Okay. Hope everybody had a good Christmas. We're back with another episode. Uh, tonight we're going to focus a little bit more on the advocacy side things or advocacy side of things for cannabis. Uh, and Kristen from Tricome Analytical has put together a really good panel here. Um, that's come out in support for patients to grow their own cannabis in New Jersey. So without any more delay on my end, Kristen, I'll let you take things from here and I'll dip out and run things in the background. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm Kristen from Tricom Analytical. Uh, Tricom Analytical is New Jersey's first cannabis testing laboratory uh, within the state. We've been operating for over three years. We're DEA registered, um, CRC um, licensed um, to provide cannabis testing. And one of the things that uh, I've been focusing on in the last month uh, is this uh, an issue with home grow where I was actually, uh, someone reached out to me asking for clarification on testing requirements because that was one of the excuses that was being made against um, the allowing home grow cultivations that, that it wasn't safe. I clarified the regulations that, you know, um, personal use cannabis testing is allowed in New Jersey. And uh, I met up with a lot of people that are interested in kind of pushing this forward. Um, so I put up this panel so we can sort of discuss the current um, the current uh, situation in New Jersey, what we can do. Um, there is a, sort of a time constraint right now uh, regarding getting stuff uh, to committee before the end of this session, uh, which ends early next month. So. Uh, before uh, diving into everything, I want uh, to just hand it over to everyone to give uh, introductions. So I'm just going to start to my right, which would be Sam. Sam, can you uh, introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. My name's Sam. Uh, sorry, I'm not on camera at the moment. I will be on in one sec. Um, I am a uh, I'm a grower and a patient in New Jersey. I started growing a couple of years ago to try and better treat my own conditions. And it's been an interesting journey since then, meeting other growers and connecting with other patients to, you know, try and get all this home grow stuff through finally. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Andrea, do you want to go next? Sure, hi. My name is Andrea Rabel. I'm actually a medical patient in New Jersey. I have epilepsy and permanent and progressive brain damage. So the cannabis treatments that I need are highly specific. I need very, very clean medicine and I need very strain specific medicine. So under New Jersey laws right now, I'm pretty much trapped and I don't have access to what I need. So I'm still having seizures and I'm still having problems, but I can't even go into the hospitals because um, we passed Jay Koenig's Institutional Caregivers in 2019. So almost five years now that we were supposed to be allowed to use our cannabis medicine in hospitals and hospices, and the committee that's supposed to implement it is completely gone. So the only option I really have right now, being too sick to work full time, is to approach the Senate full time and fight for our rights for home grow. So we have our medicine at home and in the hospitals and in the hospices where People really need it. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul? Uh, yeah, hey, um, Paul from Green Dragon Hydroponics. Um, we're a grow supply store. Uh, it's been in business about eight years now. Um, um, the store itself had been there much longer and I'd taken it over um, in 2017. And um, um, obviously like since legalization, we're trying to organize and push for what we need as a community, um, which has um, become a focal point, I feel, around the store. Um, we've, we've just kind of little by little, uh, year by year, had um, just uh, industry events and um, have built that into a, um, a really great community with a lot of um, passionate people that um, I do feel we're left out of on a, of legalization. You know, um, we're talking about hobbyists and people that are really trying to pursue what is a, a specific needs, you know, and um, and I guess what uh, preferences, you know, because there's so many uh, choices out and 
trying to develop a model and a way uh, with Kristen's help to um, to one reduce times that we need uh, times for um, uh, finding med medicine and uh, methods for um, for finding the right profiles for patients. Um, yeah, that's what we're up to now. So, thank you, uh, Rongo. Uh, hi, I'm just a longtime connoisseur and lover of the plant. Um, I grow and breed. Uh, I've done it in a handful of states, one of them being New Jersey at multiple points in time. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's about it. Just just love the plant all around. Thank you. Yeah, so a little bit of uh, background of the, the current status. I saw that there was a question in the chat regarding the, the legislation and, and how it's currently going. Um, so there, there are two bills that have been proposed uh, in both the Senate and the Assembly in New Jersey in the beginning of last year. Uh, one is for uh, medical um, home cultivation. The other is for both personal use and medical cultivation. There is more support, um, bipartisan support for the medical uh, home cultivation, which is uh, the focus that uh, that we have taken to try to get that pushed through uh, in a timely manner to allow for, for patient uh, home grow. Um, there have over the years always been sort of um, some uh, rendition of these bills going through uh, the Senate and the Assembly, although none have gone to committee. And a lot of that uh, pushback has been from Senator, uh, uh, the, the President uh, Scatari um, who has not allowed it to go to committee and then subsequently not allowed it to go to vote, even though there is bipartisan support. So if we do uh, have that pressure to get it to vote, it is likely that it would pass. Um, some of the reasoning uh, these, uh, that they have taken on uh, blocking this bill is uh, regarding uh, taxes, safety, and allowing the time for the uh, legal industry to mature. They're concerned that this would contribute to the illegal industry um, for the medical home grow. Uh, obviously taxes is like a non-issue here because medical uh, cannabis is not taxed in New Jersey. Uh, as far as the safety, I, um, you know, obviously uh, personal use consumers can get testing uh, under the New Jersey regulations. So uh, that has, was also a non-issue. And then for uh, the argument that they're allowing the industry time to develop, I mean, it's been 14 years since uh, we have had medical um, medical program in New Jersey. And actually the first um, medical bill that was uh, pushed through the Senate and then it was, uh, that was actually changed, the New Jersey Compassionate Use uh, Medical Marijuana Act did include home grow. It was passed by Scatari, by the Senate, and it was changed in the assembly. So we're at this weird uh, point of uh, contradicting um, uh, views uh, throughout the state, and we want to continue to put pressure on them to um, allow patients to grow. Um, Andrea has, uh, I've, I've spoken with her a lot on this issue regarding the current failures in the medical program um, that has uh, kind of blocked certain access uh, depending on conditions because they, we don't have the uh, availability of cultivars and uh, the consistency required to really provide for patients in New Jersey. So Andrea, do you want to speak on that a little bit? Sure, I'd love to take the chance because a lot of people don't realize the situation in New Jersey. They think if you have recreational cannabis, of course you have medical home grow. Here in New Jersey, patients can still receive five to 10 years per plant. So the stakes are a little high, the stakes are a little different. Um, but unfortunately in the dispensaries, they have to cater to the mass population, meaning custom strains and strains really for specific medical conditions like mine probably aren't too popular and it's not worth the dispensary's time to carry them. The other thing is they have to constantly change out their strains to market to new, new customers or recreational customers that treat this like flavors. But for medical patients like me, the difference in the terpene profile, even in just phenotypes, 
can be the difference between preventing a seizure or actually triggering one. Um, because I've been without proper access for so long, I've had to really look into the science on the terpenes and what makes different strains different. And I've even been able to recreate part of it into a tincture that can stop a seizure. But unfortunately, by the time a seizure starts, it could be too late. With anyone with epilepsy, there's a condition called SUDEP. It's sudden and unexplained death in epilepsy. Medically, there is nothing they can do about it. They can't they can't stop it once you're in status epileptics. Um, and any seizure can be fatal. So the only protection is prevention. And the prevention aspects aren't working without whole plant medicine. And I'm even partnered with a neuroscientist at this point, and we can't finish our research without access to whole plant medicine. We're ready to convert this to a nasal spray that can save lives, like the equivalent of a Narcan for seizures or the equivalent of an EpiPen for seizures and something that's non-toxic. Um, we're ready to keep going with our research and we can't. And personally, I'm ready to be able to grow my own plants and have access to the strains that I've been struggling to find for almost a decade. But New Jersey is threatened that we want to be gangsters, not gardeners. I just want access to my own plants. I just want access to my own medicine because I need to do custom genetic breeding projects. That's why the 10 by 10 canopy language is so important. With four plants, even if they let me set up my tents tomorrow, the chances that I get this strain stabilized and crossed in time with zero grow experience, the chances are slim to none. So the truth is we need recreational patients to be able to grow. We need our friends to be able to help us. But if right now, at least if we can get the medical patients the access they need, we can continue the research and we can keep fighting to get the rest of you home grow too. Um, but we only have until January 4th to get this on the committee agenda. Skatari has blocked this from being on the agenda multiple times, even though he has supported a bill for mushroom home grow in this state, <laughs> while this cannabis home grow bill has been shelved forever. Um, so, the justifications they have are pretty are pretty slim, but we do have a lot of community support, which I believe is on this side actually. And the more emails we send, the more attention we're getting, and we're actually getting through. On January third, I'm able to have a meeting with the chairman of the committee, Senator Vitali, and by tomorrow around lunchtime, I should be hearing back from the schedule at Senate President Skatari's office. We are getting there. We are being heard. If I only have 15 minutes to prove that we're ready for an informational hearing, we have that capability. We have people at labs. We have experienced growers. We have organizations of doctors and out-of-state caretakers who've worked directly with kids with cancer and who can vouch for how important these phenotypes and this genetic control is and how important this 10 by 10 canopy language and home grow bill is. If we don't get it by January 4th, we pretty much have to reintroduce it. It's going to be weeks or months before we even have the opportunity to be heard again. So anyone who's willing to sign an industry support letter, please reach out. Anyone who's willing to send a one-click email where if you don't know what to say, don't worry, it's filled out for you. We can, anyone who's willing to show support in any form, we could really use it right now. We have one week left. So for all the medical patients in New Jersey, because most of us are too sick to come out here and fight this, please just send an email if that's all you're willing to do. But if you're willing to do more, come out to Trenton on January 4th. Let's let them know it's not just one patient alone fighting this. Yeah, that's uh, very well put. And I think, um, you know, you're touching on also another big thing that we're trying to push for here, which is the 10 by 10 canopy, which I know um, was uh, a part of uh, maybe the, the original um, legalization in California uh, regarding home grow, which regulated by canopy and not many other states do that, but it's so important um, for uh, searching for the, the phenotypes and the cultivars that work for you uh, to allow patients to grow more than four plants. Because if you're even if you're if you're growing from seed, I mean, you might get one plant out of those four that would continue on, and that's just insufficient. 
for any sort of um, medical purpose. And um, I think that's extremely important to, to sort of uh, talk about and, and reason why that is necessary. Um, I know I got a lot of information from Paul and um, the growers on here regarding the canopy area. Paul, do you want to talk a little bit uh, more on that issue? Um, yeah, the canopy space is most important point to us, I feel. Um, as Andrea said, um, a lot of work goes into growing and, um, you know, a lot of people that just get into it think it's easy. A lot of people that don't do it think it's easy, like growing a plant, but um, growing for medicine is not easy and you need, um, you need experience. And even for a 10 by 10, uh, that can be a big challenge for, you know, a beginner. Um, and, uh, and why, you know, help is needed along there. Um, and uh, a system needs to be made so that <clears throat> patients can um, follow a method um, of selection of genetics and um, finding specific profiles that suit their ailments. And, um, and that also is, is not easy. And, um, and even for, you know, we, we started at a 10 by 10 because uh, that makes sense. If you, you know, watch Build a Soil or Jeremy's 10 by 10 series, um, you'll see what it looks like. But um, I guess um, uh, that size space is enough that you could, you know, flower on one side and hunt genetics on another. But in Andrea's case, I would... I would say that's not enough space. Um, I think that you need to go further in depth and work with, a, you know, somebody a breeder like like Rongo, and um, and you have to hunt a lot of plants. I mean, commercial breeders hunt th uh, over a thousand seeds of one one um, cultivar at, to find their specific uh, one and. Um, so for medical, um, that becomes even more of a challenge and that should be done more on commercial side, what, you know, um, to, to help patients. And I think the main route is that, um, that people making the laws and rules don't understand any of this. And, um, and it doesn't provide a, um, a good structure or, or environment to learn how to do these things, how, how, um, you know, aside from just going to the dispensary and being like, oh, I'll try that one, you know, I mean, uh, and not to mention, you know, all the, I mean, their, their market cultivars or strains that are being uh, sold at dispensaries. They're not, they're a lot of times mixed with very similar genetics that are meant to appeal for flavor, as Andrea said, um, you know, and, and, effect but medical goes much beyond that so um it's just not an easy task to uh to hunt and a 10 by 10 is is really the bare minimum but we felt it was reasonable to to start to say um you know and and the their fears are so uh, so i mean we're talking about generations of fear you know that that has been built um through this so um, those fears that, and their reasons why, um, you know, people jumping fences and, um, you know, just starting uh, letting the illicit market go wild. Um, well, you know what, it's, it's not 15, 20 years ago when people could make a profit doing, um, you know, uh, illegal grows. It's, it's, um, so much now is is built around uh, small batch cultivation and um, the passion because that's about what I see all that uh, you know people around me have is it's just a it's just a really strong passion for growing for the plant to be uh, and for for finding their own remedies because it's it, it's it's an option for so many that's that's beyond um, you know taking pills or uh, prescription medicine so um I, we can you know probably go a little further in depth or rongo can 
uh, go more in depth into how um, selection process. But um, yeah, I think it's a it's it's a fair start the ten by ten and um, and I really uh, I'm not sure why why there aren't that many states focused on canopy versus plant count, but um, the plant count just doesn't doesn't make much sense to me at all, especially when you're just talking about four, that's barely recreational. And, and if you uh, just say you have four um, and you need to pop a pack of 12 to start, I mean, so they said four in veg. So how do you get four to go to bloom and four specific ones that have like at least vigor and initial um, strength through veg to decide, which shouldn't be that way anyways, because you can have a small, slow-growing plant that f fits a specific profile, and often medical um, cultivars or, or ones that do feel medicinal, um, which a lot of us kind of, you know, may gear towards land race or like um, they take a lot longer to um, to flower, and they don't yield as much, and um, um, it's just. Uh, it's not as easy as, as people think, and it's not as scary as they make it to be. And um, we just need our space to um, focus on what we need to focus on to help patients like Andrea. Yeah. And to his point about it not being enough canopy size for real medicine, in New Jersey, we don't have proper access to things like RSO. And if you go into the dispensary asking for advice on RSO, I've seen things labeled RSO dablicators that are actually filled with distillate. And if you read the product descriptions, it'll explain that it's distillate. Distillate will give me a seizure. Specific types of RSO can prevent or stop it, but strain specific RSO is not available anywhere in New Jersey. Or if I'm wrong, I would really love someone to reach out and correct me because it's something I look for. Um, we at least need the access to try, you know, like he was saying, the 10 by 10 is a start, but hopefully that's a stepping stone to having real caretaker programs where completely inexperienced patients like me shouldn't have to try to figure out the science and figure out the skill set of growing to make our own medicine. Diabetics don't need to make their own insulin. That's kind of the whole point. Um, outside of that, they're punishing patients in a lot of ways. Um, and hospice patients can't get access in a hospice, even with paying for their registration through the state and having dispensary purchased medication, they're still not allowed to use it. There's basic injustices that have been going on since the start of this program, especially when most states have medical home grow we're the only state with a recreational program that doesn't have medicinal home grow. If you go to other states and you tell them like our testing batch size is a hundred pounds, they'll realize that they look at me with horror and realize like, there's no way you actually know the terpene profiles on what you're smoking, especially by the time they degrade from the grow and every step of the process to when they're sitting and waiting on dispensary shelves. They act like home grow is going to be dangerous because we don't have access to appropriate testing or information. Home grow is the only case where someone like me can control the conditions of everything from the genetics to the soil science to how I handle my medicine at the end. Home grow really is our only option. And the only way we've gotten this far is because information is not illegal. We're allowed to study. We're allowed to communicate. You know, information can cross state lines from where there are experienced people who are safe to talk about it. There is information when we can actually look at the COAs from labs. We have our own information if we can test our own home grow because a 10 by 10 canopy size, I can promise you I'm not pulling 100 pounds. There's no way my test batch could be that size it's safer conditions, but they refuse to listen to any of the experts. They refuse to listen to any of the industry. So we just need to make them understand that like, this is a human rights issue because 
they need to at least hold an informational hearing. Like lives are on the line with this. It's gone too far. There was a woman, Cheryl Miller, who from New Jersey, who passed away over 20 years ago, trying to do demonstrations that cannabis is medicinal for MS, multiple sclerosis. She would even go so far as to do demonstrations down in Washington and get arrested in her gurney. You know, people have been dying, trying to prove this for decades and New Jersey won't listen. I have made a public offer that I will go in front of the Senate and I will trigger a seizure with certain strains of cannabis and I will stop it with other strains of cannabis if that's what they need to see to prove that strains matter and access to clean and safe medicine matters. But they don't want to listen to me alone. So that's why we need panels like this. We need experience like this because I've never grown a plant. I, I don't know how hard it is, but I know New Jersey is allowed to grow tomatoes and we're allowed to brew beer and wine. Not many people bother to. We're happy to pay for convenience. Um, but homebrew is a lot more dangerous than home grow. They're scared of gardens and they're scared of <laughs> sick people having plants. I don't think they understand that if I was allowed a 10 by 10, there is not a single chance I would be selling any of that medication. I need that and it's not even enough. So anyone with different perspectives or experience that's willing to speak out, like I said, we have one week left. January 4th is the last day. So it's a good time to get loud. Could yeah, we, uh, I was just going to say, can we explain uh, uh, just at this point what they can do? Uh, just links or follow. If we have the links in the description, I'm not sure. Yeah, so we have been making pretty good progress with the email links, uh, which was posted in the chat. Uh, so that uh, links directly to an email template, which describes, you know, what we and you can customize it uh, with with whatever um, you want to, to tell to them. But it goes directly to Vitaly, who is the uh, senator who needs to put it on committee. And then it also goes to Skatari, who is the uh, the Senate president that has been blocking this in, in the past. And we hope that he does not continue to block it for the January uh, 4th uh, committee uh, meeting where this can be discussed uh, before the end of uh, this session. Um, so we have uh, gotten good progress with the amount of outreach that we've had uh, just from an individual basis. And anyone can send this email. This is from any perspective that's um, interested in New Jersey home grow. Um, if you are uh, part of uh, the industry in New Jersey, we have a separate letter um, of support that uh, we are trying to get signatures on, uh, just stating, you know, we're in the industry, we can, we understand how it operates, we're cultivators, we're manufacturers, we're retailers. Um, we do not agree uh, with the statement that uh, the industry is not yet mature enough to allow for the home cultivation for medical patients, um, because they're, they're basically shifting the blame on the industry. And there's over, uh, you know, 100 uh, annual licensees now that um, are operating or close to operating on the retail cultivation manufacturing side, and none, none of these operators agree with this. There are even several current operators uh, that were, uh, you know, grandfathered into the adult use program from the medical that they're not fighting against this. Uh, it's bizarre uh, to me that this is still an issue, that this is still being blocked in the Senate um, based off of a misunderstanding of what the industry needs when the industry is coming out and saying, this is not this is not true. We support um, medical home grow. Uh, I know that there will be more um, outward support in the new year, uh, but you know this is something that we've been working on for a, a while now, and making a lot of uh, immediate progress. Probably a little bit more than we thought. We, you know, I've had uh, meetings with uh, Singleton's office, who's the primary bill sponsor on the medical and uh, now with Andrea meeting with Vitaly uh, next week. Um, we have heard discussions are being had behind closed doors regarding this bill, trying to figure out, because you know we're not just asking for them to pass it, we're asking for them to change it to a 10 by 10 canopy area and then pass it. So there certainly is some confusion and lack of understanding on their end, but I know that, I know that certain people have been 
the certain certain programs within the state, whether it's the hemp program uh, to the CRC, they've, they have been consulted on this. Uh, so we hope that they understand the immediate need for this language to change to a 10 by 10 area and for it to go in front of the of the Senate and the Assembly before the end of the session. It, it is a, a patient rights issue that has is long overdue. I mean, this should have been legalized in 2010. Uh, and, you know, it's 13 years later. So um, there was a question in the chat that, Sam, I wanted to give it to you because um, someone asked, um, I'm from Jersey, what's the best way to start or a community or join one? There's actually a few uh, great communities in New Jersey already. Um, they're, depending on whether you prefer um, Discord or Telegram. I have a couple of chats that I can give you, um, but they go by the uh, the Cultivation Cafe as well as the Tri-State Cultivators. Um, they're both awesome groups of growers and connoisseurs that just really have an appreciation for the plant and, you know, have a lot of knowledge that you might not find in other places. Um, it's been really nice to connect with those people and we definitely have an awesome community in New Jersey. It's been it's been great to get to know everybody. Um, I hope to see you at some of our meetups and stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, or stop, stop by the store and say hi. Oh yeah, or yes, I, I totally, yeah. I don't know why I liked on that, but also uh, Green Dragon Hydroponics there. Uh, it's a members uh, club and uh, grow shop. So they have everything that you could need to grow your own as well as a really awesome community of people um it's been just such a wonderful time connecting with everyone down there we host competitions and various other just community events for everyone to connect whether it be seed swaps or farmers markets or um you know we had women's days where we had kristen and some of our other friends come on and put on put on a date for them uh so it's been really it's been awesome uh all the different things that we get to do down there yeah we have um We've been doing uh, member nights Wednesday and Friday uh, just to kind of come and hang out. Um, we have a member space and um, uh, we just try to keep, you know, keep it, uh, keep it fresh, try different things. Um, you know, we have a projector and screen for 101s and 201s and um, the store really focused, you know, on, on that community because we feel like we've built something special. Um, I really, haven't gone to other states and found what what we have currently, and um, uh, it's it, it's it's allowed for people to come out and express themselves um, because it's kind of like a community based model where we allow you know other people whoever has a passion and focus um, can present on a on a day and um, and then yeah we we. Uh, we just try to stay creative and um, build interest and keep new people coming back. And, uh, um, you know, and that's that's been a lot because of uh, the decline in retail. Um, we've had to be creative, but um, uh, what we found from it is, you know, for real, a beautiful thing for sure. Um, just seeing uh, even older people, you know, because this isn't California, you know, the, the culture is has been um we've been in the dark ages up until like you know a couple years ago um so for growers to come out and connect with each other is uh is really big and even for you know the previous generation to uh who've been in their garages and basements smoking out of cans you know for the past decades uh for them to come out and say holy there's a whole like large community of people just like me and you look in the mirror and you you understand what they've been through and what um and yeah it's a so that's a great experience as well so definitely stop down just pop in say hey what's up we're there i also like for me as someone who's on the younger side of some of these growers as honestly on the younger side of most of the growers that i know um i think experiences like that can be really important um because we have strayed really far over the past few years with so much, you know, it's been all about recreational and about adult use. And 
all of these different things. And the patients have really fallen by the wayside. And, you know, this was all built by people during times when it was really illegal for patients. It was, that was what a lot of this was about. And so like getting to connect with people that have been doing this, some of them as long as I've been alive um, and hearing the stories of what they went through, it's, it's really powerful because people my age and people younger than me have no frame of reference of those things of like what everyone truly went through. Um, and like the people they know, there have been, you know, cancer patients on the run for a decade just to continue to be able to access her medicine. And she went by the original outcast. Um, and just like hearing stories like that and getting connected to people like that has been some of the most powerful experiences of my life. I, I have always been passionate about cannabis and medical cannabis, but being able to hear what these people went through just to provide medicine to other people has been really, really eye opening. Um, I, I knew what it was like, but I don't know. It's different when you hear it from someone that went through it. Patients and the people willing to stick their necks out to protect them are the only reason this plant survived prohibition. They're also the only people who actually have the knowledge and experience to be able to use it appropriately as medication. If I go into a dispensary, they'll often recommend me something that can trigger a seizure on the spot. If I go talk to a community of growers and I say, these are the strains that help me, They'll often say, hey, I know where you might be able to find a cross of that. Or have you tried this strain? It's been similar and it's worked for other patients that are like you. If I, no one cares about their, the quality of their medicine as much as medical patients who rely on it to save their life. Um, so a lot of times those are growers now too. But like Sam was saying, we need to learn from the older generation you know, we're in our 20s. We don't have the decades of experience that some of these people do. But these people don't feel comfortable speaking up and stepping up when the state and the government has persecuted them for so long, when they're at such a high risk, where they know if they speak up for a patient like me, that puts the other patients they caretake for at risk. These aren't the people who should be on the front lines of the battle with the government. None of us should have to be at this point. We're decades into this. Um, but it's really important to protect that passed down knowledge, that legacy knowledge, because that's the only real knowledge that exists. If you look on the CRC website and look at how they define concentrates, it specifies that they have to be used. They have to be high THC only to be used out of vaping or dabbing. And they specify that solvents are used. The CRC has no clue what they're regulating and the government has no clue what they're regulating because everything I need to use is solventless. They're disregarding high CBD versions. They're disregarding hash and rosin, these really clean medicines that don't have any of these extra chemicals. They're scared of a misunderstanding and they need to take the opportunity to educate themselves. I think there's a gap in the language between the legacy market and like the researchers. And I think there's also a gap between the cannabis community as a whole and the politicians trying to approach them with some of the heavy science like Kristen is able to. Unfortunately, some of these senators, the highest form of education they had was high school. And while that means they might be great representatives for the people approaching them with this science might be speaking a language they don't understand. And if you're approaching them as growers, they have the stigma that you're a criminal. So it's time for patients and their families and their community, like your local deli to speak up because they're worried, New Jersey's worried about commerce, but dead people don't buy things. I can't support buying something that is going to give me a seizure and threaten my life. It's either you get none of my money or you let me home grow and I can choose to spend any disposable income or recreational dollars at your facilities where you guys have millions of dollars more than me and should be able to make products at a better quality than I can. But HomeGrow would give me the chance to survive enough to participate in your economy. Um, 
So I don't know. I think whatever your background is, whatever your involvement is with cannabis, even if it's just unfortunately knowing someone that we weren't able to save in time or that wasn't able to get access or information in time. You know, it's it's time to tell the state of New Jersey enough is enough. Like <laughs> we have the evidence and we're ready to present it. Enough is enough. I had four people come to me this month that lost friends due to seizures in hospitals where they couldn't stop it. If I go into a hospital, I will be denied access to the medication that I know and my friends and family know can save my life. They'll be forced to watch me until I expire or until they go against my medical consent and give me a lobotomy like they had proposed about six years ago. I don't know if this is a bigger platform than I've ever had the chance to talk to. I don't have social media. I'm photosensitive. So finding people like Paul from Green Dragon and Sam and Kristen who are actually willing to listen or willing to step up and speak up. It's been a pretty incredible year. And we're down to the last week and I would love to be around to see us all celebrate this win together. And I would love to see how many more people, how many more incredible people like this we can meet in that next week. So get your emails out, get your calls out, reach out to me directly. Um, my email is rabelresearch at gmail.com. So rabel like it's spelled on the screen here and then research um, at gmail.com and join the fight join the fight or come out to Trenton on January 4th and show them that we're real. Yeah. And thanks a lot. We, 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 I mean, I, and everybody appreciates your, your courage and um, it's, it, it's not easy what you're doing and to be able to do it with the composure and everything. Uh, we, we really appreciate um, you fighting up and saying and showing people what exactly it is um because you know yeah we need people to stand up like you said and uh let's hope that uh we can get somewhere with this bill and and make some some things work um and if you're out of state you know i mean hey do you are you passionate about new jersey's laws do you want to help us it doesn't matter just drop the email um you can like Kristen said, change it how you want. Um, I keep the political language the same. Um, we're all fighting for the same tiny little 10 by 10 uh, canopy that that we're uh, hopes that we're able to, um, you know, pursue more um, smaller scale and more focused um, medicine. Um, Andrea, do you want to touch on like what has actually been helping you? I know you're still, you know, doing a lot of research and stuff into that, but would you want to touch on that a little bit? Sure. Actually, the things that help me, for the most part, sativas are more of a high risk variety because of certain terpenes in there that can set off seizures. So for the most part, indicas are considered safer for me. But there's a very specific cross where it crosses a very high sativa with a very low indica. And it creates this ratio that's both neuroprotective and effective at like kicking my brain back on. This one strain is what would work best for a rescue medication like a nasal spray. Essentially, it would hit me like defibrillator paddles. The reason canopy language and the ability to home grow is so important is because that's not what I need on my day to day life. Hopefully you're not getting hit with defibrillator paddles every day. I need to cross it down heavier with more of the neuroprotectants and less of the stimulants to be able to make something that's a preventative, um, which would work more like a pacemaker if we're doing the defibrillator equivalency. Um, it seems like a lot of rare terps and really, really volatile terps tend to have the most medicinal effects. That's why, like Paul was mentioning, land race it tends to work a lot of well, really well for a lot of patients because the more you cross and hybrid all these different strains together, you're only going to be getting like the dominant traits. You're losing these finite little details out of the palette. But sometimes it is only a fraction of a percentage of a really volatile terp like felandrine that 
could completely change the ratios. Um, so what works for me isn't necessarily going to be what works for anybody else. Finding your strain is like finding your fingerprint, but we're getting to the point where we're going to be able to do a lot more predictive resources with that because we're starting to understand how certain terpenes work and synergistic profiles and we'll have starting points where then we can customize it for every individual patient based on their responses and eventually based on biometric data. Um, and also your biochemistry constantly changes the same way, like when you go through puberty or menopause or when you gain a lot of weight or change jobs, you know, your diet might change. Same thing with your medical needs. Everyone knows that tolerance is an issue in cannabis, but tolerance is also an issue in pharmaceuticals. There's a reason suddenly people end up with, you know, Xanax prescriptions that are in the triple digits for the month. It, we need to be able to be our own advocates and control our own medication. So me standing here and telling you this is exactly what's going to work for you isn't going to work any better than New Jersey sitting there and telling me this is what's going to work for you. We need the community of growers and we need access to our medication. Um, I would say if you're struggling to figure out what type of strains work for you, record everything, write down every strain you've tried and anything you notice from it. Um, and eventually you'll be able to start seeing patterns. It might be lineage like going all going back towards a certain land race, or it could be the way it was grown. I'm super sensitive to a lot of different pesticides and contaminants. I have a mold allergy. If I get moldy weed, it doesn't matter what strain it is. That's a problem. <laughs> so finding people who are educated too helps a lot with finding your strains other people who have been experienced and it might seem crazy that other people can try your medicine ahead of time for you. But if you lived with a person long enough, you might be able to guess what meal they might like at a restaurant. It's the same thing. It's based on your palate. Um, or if there are growers who have dealt with genetics for a long time, they can almost smell it like a sommelier or, you know, back in the day, the kings had royal tasters. Tasters That way, someone else would try their food before they did to know if it's poison. So I have certain friends that know there are certain dangerous terpenes for me. Like a lot of the chems and sours and things like that really don't do well for me. So it could take a perfectly safe strain and ruin my day or put me at risk. So having people that can taste it ahead of time because you have no clue if it actually lines up with the dispensary labeling based on how long it sat there and how the profiles degraded. So having people that can actually like taste it ahead of time and warn you, like, I think that has, you know, I think that's really high in a certain citrus terp that's bad for you. So reaching out and finding community because information is not illegal, looking at different websites like Allbud or Ask Growers where you can search by medical conditions or you can see the full terpene profiles, start collecting your data and eventually you'll see your patterns. Or like I said, my email is out there, just reach out to me directly and I will help you personally try to sort through it the best I can. We're in the process of establishing an educational nonprofit based in the state of New Jersey, but ideally eventually it'll cross lines. And this is to focus on the safe and effective handling of medicinal plants. And that includes everything from chamomile to cannabis, because without hands-on education and without experienced education, without closing that gap between legacy knowledge and commercial knowledge, there are so many patients falling through the gaps and there are so many people willing to help that don't have a way to. Um, so if you're nervous right now, the future is gonna be better but reach out right now. The only thing you can do is use your voice and more people will be willing to help than you'd expect. Could we mention also about, you know, I mean, terpene profiles about how, you know, most, most uh, commercial grows are irradiating their flower. Um, and Kristen, you, you probably know exactly how many um, 
but uh, the fact that that would uh, you talk about volatile terpenes mm -hmm. that 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 knocks out up to thirty or more percent, um, you know, of the terpenes that the flower has. So it literally, like, cooks off what is needed by patients. So. And that's like honestly, in the event that you can trust whatever you're finding at the legal dispensary. Um, because I know that there are things right now in New Jersey dispensaries that are, have a label from an old batch on the bag that you would buy in the store. But the COA that I have access to as a employee of the New Jersey cannabis program, I have access to see that those numbers do not match up. It's something I just found on a most recent delivery and we're working on fixing it and bringing it up to the proper people but like things like that as andrea said like things like that can be really really dangerous for people like it's just it's it's horrible and i don't like i don't know what to what i can how much i can do about it i've brought it up to all the right people but like as far as New Jersey goes, like they're probably looking at like a twenty thousand dollar fine and don't do it again. And that's not good enough because something like that literally could trigger a seizure and kill Andrea, like just like that. And it wouldn't we wouldn't have time to fix it. It could literally be deadly and I just, I don't know, like seeing things like that in highly regulated markets, just it scares me, honestly, because it's like the one thing that is supposed to be is that like this stuff is safe because it's tested and it's exactly what it says on the package. And we know that because of all these laws, like how is this stuff squeaking through? It's just, it's really upsetting. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree. I, I, I certainly see that in the New Jersey cannabis industry, um, since, you know, it is so new, testing is new to them, you know, under the medical program, they tested the first cultivation batch of each variety, they used those results for up to eight years, uh, I was seeing within the program, um, they never tested for terpenes, they never did any of that. So just in the last three years, uh, when we started testing within the program, that's the first time that terpenes were ever reported to clients and I feel like, or consumers. And I, I feel like that transition hasn't gone smoothly because there's no um, serious regulation by the state to make sure that things are labeled properly, that they're tested properly. Uh, the last panel I was on on this uh, channel was due, uh, regarding lab shopping, which is a huge problem, not only in New Jersey, but in states all across the country uh, where you can't even trust your laboratory results. And because there's no enforcement on the labs, those labs continue to do what they want to do. And uh, the only person that suffers is the end patient because uh, they don't know the what they're getting is uh, correctly labeled or that it's clean and free of contaminants. Um, I would also state that I have seen within the program there is um, a lack of uh, following the regulations as it pertains to like uh, providing the COA and things like that. It is mandated for dispensaries in New Jersey to provide the COA uh, upon request uh, with a purchase. And I, I haven't seen uh, many dispensaries able to do that uh, when you're purchasing from them. So if, if anyone in this uh, chat um, that's watching right now do uh, participate in the New Jersey legal market and purchase, um, start asking for those COAs because they are legally mandated to provide that information to you. And um, I've seen them uh, not be able to do that. So there, there's also a complaint log that uh, that's hosted through the CRC website. Uh, so if you do purchase something, they can't give you a COA, file a complaint. I think that's really the only way to, to get anything done is to overwhelm them and annoy them. Um, with uh with these uh complaints and requests and i mean we have seen progress as as far as the home grow goes with uh basically we're trying to annoy the shit out of them right like just send them emails four times a day and say we need this now um from as many people as we can uh for because you know the majority of people support it in new jersey but we're so 
disillusioned by the past 15 years within this state that nothing's going to happen because it's so corrupt and all this. But if we continue to annoy them to the point where they're spending hours a day sorting through our emails, they will have to do something about it because they can't justify spending hours uh, sifting through our emails. Um, uh, that's just asking for basic patient rights. Uh, how, how can they justify that? Because at this point, all of their arguments make no sense and we just need to continue fighting. Hey, Rongo, um, would you uh, maybe describe a little bit about like, um, if you're, a, you know, maybe not even a 10 by 10, but if you just wanted to hunt and select your own genetics, um, like, for medical um, or not, like, um, uh, well, I, I got a few things I could touch on. Actually, I I, I would like to to, uh, to further a thought that Andrea was saying before about like the quote unquote medical system in New Jersey. Like, I, I could be wrong, but I'm also far from uninformed. And there's like, it's only medical in name. <laughs> there's nothing medical about the medical program. Uh, their their priority is profit. Um, I'm pretty sure the first six licenses, five out of six were uh, for the governor's campaign donors um when when rec did happen they were actually stopping medical patients or limiting the medical patients from the amount that they had so they could give them to rec so they could transfer the blood like it, it's kind of ridiculous and, th and that's not even talking about like genetic selection so like the uh, what what they're running is things that yield good things that are good in the normal market uh i don't see much difference between the recreational and the medical genetics i don't know anybody who's hunting for things that help epilepsy or rsd or whatever you know any any of these problems people have um it, it's yeah it's it's mind-blowing to me and, and and to transition into the growing so so with the lack of good genetics like we also don't have any nurseries so if we're only growing four plants which which is a, it's not a good metric for yield at all um it actually doesn't tie into yield at all whatsoever you can grow 15 foot plants outside that yield 10 pounds, or you can hunt the plant and flip it from, <laughs> from pop and get seven grams. Um, but yeah, so, so you really need to, it's hard to find what you're looking for. And there's lay, layers of obfuscation when you're trying to find these chemotypes. So, so there is a, you know, there's an aspect of when you're popping the seeds, you, you have to have something to look for, but you also on top of that, have to know what seeds to be popping or how to find them or pay for them or whatever. Um, 10 by 10, I think is, is good because it, it, it shows a max. Uh, the, another problem with the plant count is like, I, I know in rec states, certain people abuse it. They'll do one plant per light. Like uh, I think size and maybe wattage of lights is like the better metric of figuring out like how people are gonna abuse the law if they are. But I also believe that uh, nobody is going to be maxing that out most people are even if they're going to be trying to it's not going to work um when i first started growing getting getting a gram per watt was like amazing now i feel like it's not <laughs> um like it's it, things aren't easy there's there's you have runs if you're running regs you have you have males um it, or if even in fems and regs you have herms um hlvd yeah who, who knows uh, there's there's so many problems and then and then also the yield aspect so like yeah so a lot of people consider yields based on what this known clone is supposed to do but i have uh like some of my cuts do three light some do one it's not really like it, it, it i don't know it's a it's a bad way to like all this is thought wrong thought about wrong and it makes me feel like the people writing the laws don't know what they're talking about but also it is a little strange for me when i think of it like when they're giving out these licenses the licenses are about square footage and can it be sized they're not giving out licenses to the uh to the producers based on a number of plants and the, the, the whole four veg thing is ridiculous too so so somebody like andrea she, she's saying she might need a daytime a nighttime and an emergency medicine so she needs three moms even if you have one mom and you take your four clones for your four plants to flower, you have five plants now. It doesn't even make sense. Like, I don't know. It's just kind of, it, it, it's honestly unreal. Like, uh, like how we've gotten this far. They went, when, when someone said it before, it's been 14 years. I'm like, Oh my God, it really has. And it's about just as bad as it ever was. Yep. 
yeah, there's no been no change. The same complaints are coming up from the same facilities. And, you know, like we see time after time that like, um, you know, I mean, in, in more markets than ours, but testing facilities are favored based on THC percentages and everything else. Um, it, you know, Kristen can likely attest to that, but, um, yeah, it's, a uh, so many reasons, um, you know, why the 10 by 10 is, is better for patients. And I mean, I have to say the government for them too, you know, cause they're afraid of the outdoor cultivation. Um, you know, that people are going to be growing monster, monster plants. Like in Jersey, that's probably not as easy as California. Like with our well, I mean, climate. some states have it where like it can't be seen and it has to be like a six foot privacy plants and the plants can't be taller than six feet. Like something like that wouldn't be terrible, but it, it should be more so based on size than anything. The whole plant just makes zero sense at all. Yeah. Yet our whole, every state follows the same, like, I mean, New Jersey is, is uh, I, as I heard, they, they're they looking most to Delaware for their... Um, Maryland. Their, uh, j they're just following as far as their ideas and things, but uh, it's it's all they do is follow the state that's next to next them, and they're all bad. I mean, they're all bad programs. Let's, let's talk about, like, actually how to make, find those genetics, you know, like how... I mean, there should be programs. That's that's partially where um, the model that I've I've been trying to follow, you know, is that education and um, I mean, having mentors and um, being able, you know, being able to sift through all the information. So many people just getting into cannabis in general are overwhelmed by the amount of choices and and uh, you know feel that uh, you know likely there's always you know, shyness and intimidation, you know, uh, to, to the, the knowledge of like, you know, if, if they know indica versus sativa and, and the different terpenes and it's, it can be overwhelming. And like, how long is it really going to take a patient who gets their med card day one, who has only smoked cannabis, how long is it going to take for them to find that strain and, or even hunt it? And how much is it going to cost them? Yeah. I mean, I, but and if, with four plants, like you, it's not even reasonable for medical. Like it's not, not even. No, it's actually the opposite. You're just wasting your time and energy on nothing on maybe getting a harvest. And if you do get a harvest, maybe it'll work for you. Uh, uh, like highly unlikely. Yeah, I mean, just like, just like recreationally just trying to find like the, the the next good thing like you might need to pop 100 seeds to find something and that's not looking for a specific issue or a specific even, chemotype i mean if you're looking to take 20 to bloom you know like popping 100 i mean 20 is even you know like i i mean maybe not 100 but you're popping a lot more to um to to narrow through them and yeah, when you hunt, you you don't flower full size plants like they're, you know, they, they might they might be a, a foot to eighteen inches tall um, at finish, and uh, but you can pack, you know, forty in a five by five that is a lot. At the end, you you know you have the same canopy, um, but you're harvesting all these different um, phenotypes that have different profiles. So then afterwards you can selectively go through and pick which ones, you know, are your keepers. So in a pack of 12, you're only looking for one, um, maybe two. I mean, depends, but, um, and then how just, long just it, some it, people don't get what I'm saying. Like, like in the past, I've had one tent for hunting and one tent for clones. And I've had like a five by five for the hunt with 50 females flowering and got way under the yields that I could get in a four by four were four clones that I knew they, they yielded good. You know what I mean? So four, so four plants are yielding more than 50. So how, how is, how is like the amount of plants, the metric, it makes no sense. It's so funny that there's even any focus on yields in this discussion because it really isn't 
it, it's not important you know how much you're yielding in medical it's only like, important because that's what the, the people writing the regulations are worried about or it seems to be i mean I, and i could be wrong again but uh, i i'm pretty sure scutari said himself like a while ago like oh yeah like home growth is not a problem we just want to make sure like people are getting their their footing and making their money first yeah, yeah, he specified that New Jersey is not ready because of the threat that home grow for medical would put on the recreational markets. The, the funny part is the data in every other state says that it has no effect. It has no effect. It's the same way like I'm allergic to bread. I can't go to the store and buy exactly. bread. So me making bread at home does not affect the bread industry. They don't have the works for you. You're not going to go buy something that doesn't work for you. I'm not going to go, and I'm certainly not going to go buy something that's going to make me worse. Like, yeah, exactly. I've personally had to explain this to quite a few dispensary owners this week because I was, you know, stopping in to show my face and say, hey, can you sign our letter? And when I got to, like, they were like, so what is the letter about? And, you know, it's about two things we support Homegirl and we don't think that it will affect the market. And there was quite a few times that I got this weird, like, I don't think you know what you're talking about kind of face. And I was like, guys, like, do you realize that like, I don't shop here? The patients that I work with do not shop here. The friends that I know that shop with the growers that I know don't shop here. We Even if you don't have a medical issue, how do you trust these large facilities that are constantly getting fined and have mold and like, like what? Like why would anyone even want to support that? How can I support it when the 100 pound test batch size was supposed to be temporary and it's still going on? It's still going on. It's yeah, it's, it's completely it's out of proportion and out of scale in New Jersey. Yeah, what Squid said. Squid should be in here. Mm -hmm. What's up, bud? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's on point with what he said. It has no effect. It has no yeah. effect. And yeah, and they're not even issuing additional medical licenses. So how would medical home grow affect them? They're only catering towards the adult use market in New Jersey anyway. They gave, you know, extended licenses to all the medical cultivators. So they're all just pushing out high THC numbers. There's no genetic diversity. I mean, I know I test it. Um, there's absolutely no reason at this point. The, the most like diverse cannabinoid profiles I've seen is from home grow. These places are also owned by non-cannabis people. Like they're, they're literally just vultures on the market. Like if anyone cares about the plants, like maybe the grower or like, may, like I know a few people who work for for medical grows uh, who are very passionate, but they're all like underpaid and waiting to quit and like hate how they're treated. And these are the people that actually care and know what they're doing. And 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 some of these places don't even realize that they're riding off the backs of these people that they pay twenty dollars an hour because they're the ones who actually have the knowledge and the access to the community and are up to date with things. Yeah. That's always been crazy to me. Is like that people with access to like so much resources could do this so poorly. Like they these are million billion dollar companies that can't get it right it's insane that we actually can do a better job in our closets with limited resources they can pay every knowledgeable person to give them exactly what they need and like to be honest part of it is just like new jersey's own state regulations like these companies are not motivated to get any better which i'm hoping will change soon but like with the way our testing is the limits for some of these things which like we look for for safety like to be low some of them are so low that it would be impossible to pass testing even with a good clean grow and so these companies are not motivated to do better because it's easier for them to remediate the bad product that they grow they can keep doing a poor job and keep turning it into something sellable and smokable and people keep buying it so they won't change and that has been honestly some of the most detrimental stuff is that like in trying to keep us safe by giving us very strict testing standards they ended up just kind of screwing us over yeah any of the remediation that he's talking about done to the weed like paul and uh, rongo were saying before 
that eliminates the rare terpenes that I'm looking for. And that definitely disturbs the ratios of everything that's in the plant. Um, so for patients like me, you're just over-regulating certain areas eliminates the opportunity for medicine. You know, if you're willing to say that like the trade-offs of certain pharmaceuticals and the dangers and the risks are worth it for sick people like me, why can't we make our own choices on like what risk is worth it with our medicine at home? Um, Cause I know I would be testing my batches and I know with a 10 by 10 canopy, it wouldn't be that large and it wouldn't need to be remediated. So I don't know. It's just a really backward situation in New Jersey where any of the people with scientific experience aren't actually being listened to. It, it, Kristen would know better than I, but uh, based on what I know in other states, I would assume that most people who, the, the small amount of people who aren't radiating are probably still doing like an ozone treatment or something like that. Yeah, I think uh, most of the products in New Jersey's ozone are irradiated at this point uh, because they do have that 10,000 CFU per gram limit and they do mandate culture-based analysis. So unless you're, they're using a lab that gives them whatever they want, which I'm not saying doesn't happen, um, they usually have to do some sort of remediation. Uh, which, so going back to like, uh, to, to fully understand, I guess, the testing regulations, um, New Jersey adopted the uh, Maryland uh, regulations uh, as their medical interim regulations about two and a half, three years ago, um, where this was supposed to be a temporary set of regulations. The, the time at which they adopted these regulations, Maryland had just issued new guidance that had mandated the culture-based methods because there's two, there's two microbial methods for like a total use and mold test. Uh, they banned one of the methods that has known to underestimate the amount of yeast and mold within the product, which is a whole separate issue. Uh, and then they set the limit at 10,000 CFU per gram. Within two weeks, Maryland noticed that this, okay, this is an issue. We don't want to force uh, everyone to uh, have to radiate their product. And then that will lead to poor cultivation practices because at that point, you know, they're just not going to, to try to create clean, clean product. They're just going to remediate after. So within two weeks, they increased that limit to 100,000 CFU per gram. I've been fighting for over a year to get that same change initiated in New Jersey. Uh, but unfortunately, there's some people standing in the way um, of, of this change. Uh, most uh, laboratories are in support uh, of this change to 100,000, as Maryland did within two weeks immediately after issuing that guidance. Uh, New Jersey just still hasn't come around to that. Um, so long story short, like it's just, yeah, it's an absurd um, limit put on something that is not um, telling you if it's harmful. It's just a general load uh, count. Uh, same with total aerobic bacteria. I mean, you use beneficial microbes in your in your grow all the time. That will come up on a test and it would fail the test. So a failure for those types of organisms doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, harmful or it's going to get you sick or something like that. It is more of a quality uh, indicator test. And um, there are states like California that doesn't assign uh, those tests at all, or New York uh, recently, uh, they do require it to be tested, but they actually have no limit on there because they recognize that it's not an indicator if it's harmful uh, to ingest or anything like that. So um, we've been fighting uh, as a laboratory and through uh, my, um, I'm vice chair of the NJCBA laboratory testing committee. We've been issuing guidance to the state and all of that. But one of the main issues is that the CRC has no one with the scientific background, not even a bachelor's in like biology. They have no one there that understands uh, what we're trying to tell them. And so we're trying to act as like, you know, well, okay, we'll break it down to you. We'll explain it. Uh, to you, but they have, um, you know, stakeholders from all sides um, uh, telling them information and they really need to just hire someone um, with a scientific background to sort of get everyone in line in New Jersey. But uh, that's a total separate issue than the home grow. Um, I think in, in New Jersey, home grow, uh, you know, you can you can get it tested. I would I would recommend testing for like pathogenic types of bacteria and things like that. But um, a, a total aerobic bacteria testing isn't going to tell you anything when you're spraying bacillus on there, um, which is a beneficial microbe. 
which is why we came up with, or Kristen had come up with a home grow safety panel, um, you know, that, that uh, is just that. It's um, uh, and profile also, um, you know, and uh, I mean, how important it is to have like affordable testing if, if um, you know, you're, you're, uh, if you're hunting genetics too, you know, the profiles are in uh, the, um, the breakdown of terpenes and you can explain exactly what your, your test would uh, um, give us for medical use. But, um, you know, continuing to develop this, this method, methods of growing and methods of testing and methods of um, selecting, you know, I think is where our future needs to be for medical. It's, and, it, and it is in home grow. It's not in, it's not in the facilities. It's just, you can't, I mean, how about a greenhouse? Like, I mean, greenhouse, even large, it, it just doesn't get the attention um, that uh, home growers are putting into the passion that, um, you know, is behind everything and the care, you know, that, uh, that shows in the final product and, and uh, has some of the richest and um, profiles and, I mean, it, you can find, I mean, anywhere on the East Coast, everybody knows it's, it's not in the facilities, it's not in the dispensary, so. I might, I might sound a little crazy here, but I also believe like the, the vibes or vibrations of the person and the feelings that they have, that they are, you know, re reflecting around them, like they affect the plant. Like I, I do know that uh, people remediate soil radiation with hemp and it'll suck it out of soil and pull it up into the plant. I really do feel like, I don't know if it's your, I don't know what are the gamma rays from your brain or something, but I do think there is something like everybody I know who cares about the plant has the best weed. Like you like, I could almost sometimes just like look at the weed and tell like, like they just do this for money. Yeah. And that, and that number is dead or dying. I mean, it, it, of people doing it for money, to be honest, it's, uh, it's just literally what's left is the passion and the, and hobby and the curiosity of uh, and the exploration of of our medicine and and um you know truly what what it is i mean because there there just isn't money in it any you know anymore i mean and i mean so afraid of people blowing out 10 by 10s the, the people that are going to blow out a 10 by 10 are are the ones that don't care about any size or any number of lights or any plant count, any, they're going to do what they're going to do. And like, and, uh, I mean, just to simply give a 10 by 10 for patients is like, is it, it's just, I mean, in reality, like in what, what I hear so many actual, like really dedicated growers saying is that none of this, none of these regulations should be on us. Like this, this plant has been in people's basements for, decades and um you know what it, it's like it just should be taught safety in consumption in growing in in handling and and like you know it's like we don't need people telling us like we're we're good we can figure this out like and and uh it's just not as scary as as a lot of people make it out to be but um yeah, I mean, you know, treat it like tomatoes. I mean, even alcohol, like everybody compares it to alcohol. I, I don't like to, but like even alcohol is treated better than this. You know, you can you can brew an insane amount of liquor in your basement. They would kill people like, you know, the amount. And and I, I it, even even law enforcement that we've heard, I don't actually know any but like um even law enforcement that we've heard brothers and you know of, of friends and things that um they they understand it's really not a threat like it's it's like i i think the world and i i i really did i was hoping that like we were past you know like all that but being in the community you know we have walls around us a little bit 
not realizing that, you know, entirely how brutal that people are stuck in old mentalities and that it really just depends on what part of the county, what, you know, part of whatever, what police pulls you over, what, you know, and uh, it's just, it's not legal one. I mean, the plant weed is not legal in New Jersey as far as I've, I'm concerned. I don't know. But hopefully one day. I agree with you there. <laughs> when you talk about, you know, them being scared and fear, I think the politicians are completely ignorant to the patient perspective and what we're scared of. Um, Cause me, like a lot of other patients, the medical industry, like the pharmaceutical and the doctors gave us no hope. Like they told us to just lay down and wait for things to get worse. And then insurance will cover the surgeries or, you know, they told us you won't be able to work or things like that. You won't be able to drive. They really gave us no hope and they gave our families no hope. You know, we've had the, we'll keep her comfortable conversations. You know, if they were right six months, you know, without the pharmaceuticals, I would have been back there and it's over six years. The only times I've had problems are without access or when I'm, you know, been at the mercy of the black market, which is different than the legacy growers. You know, those are the people who will blackmail you or threaten you or take advantage of the fact you're a female and in a desperate position. Like we need the legal supports in place because there are people that want to follow the rules that want to do this stuff. And we can't, um, but the opportunity to educate myself, the opportunity to learn what's going on or have a say in my medicine, that's hope. That's not fear. You know, I'm scared I won't get the chance to see like a mature pot plant before I die when I know that's the thing that could keep me alive. Like I'm trying to stay above reproach for New Jersey because they need to listen to someone, but what they're scared of is the only thing that gives people hope, like curiosity and agency is the opposition of fear. And I think that's been overregulated away from us for too long. And that the programs that are built on the blood of patients, like this was first given to people who were terminal because they figured like, oh, what's it gonna do? What's it gonna hurt? They wouldn't have a recreational industry to care about the commerce of if it wasn't for legacy growers protecting information, if it wasn't for patients like dying to advocate. We need to show them what they should really be scared of. And that's the way the community is going to react if they keep dragging this out. If we don't get this by January 4th, they should be scared that we're coming at them with a national media storm with support from all these other states that I see popping up in the chat. They should be scared that we're going to call for emergency decriminalization and call it a human rights issue instead. They're scared of plants. They should be scared of the community actually stepping up because it's been too long and we deserve to grow hope, you know, it's simple as that. I missed Hawaii's question. Um, not sure. I can't actually see that, but uh, anybody else can. We we ended up getting that one, Paul. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam, Sam picked up the slack there for me. Gotcha. Actually, I have a question, Andrea, and uh, it's kind of a personal one. But how did you realize that cannabis was the medication that you needed? Well, they had, the doctors had me on combinations of up to nine different pharmaceuticals at points. You know, they would send me out of appointments with ShopRite bags full of sample packs. We can't pretend they knew what they were doing with those concoctions and combinations any better than a novice home grower would. The medications were making my quality of life unbearable and <laughs> unlivable and one of the ones they had me on had me 
throwing up every day for over a year with nothing I could do about it. And they were threatening to hospitalize me for being underweight. I had nurses helping me fake my vitals. Like it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but the more you learn about New Jersey corruption, the scarier the reality is. And I just started smoking cannabis to be able to keep food in my stomach. Like I just needed to be able to eat. And, you know, at the time, the doctor's opinion was like, hey, there's going to be days where you have like seizure activity that's not full blown seizures. It's like migraines and stuff worse than that. And, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Avoid stairs. Don't drive. Blah, 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 blah. Just deal with it. There's no kind of inhaler for epilepsy. So I just wanted to be able to eat. I just wanted to, you know, stay out of the hospitals and eat food at home. And I was having that seizure activity that the, all those symptoms and I just smoked to be able to eat dinner and it cleared everything up. You know, my partner at the time like looked at me and was just blown away. They're like, are you back? Like, are you here right now? Because my epilepsy affects my eyes. So sometimes they'll even look like a super sped up typewriter and my whole face and everything cleared up. And it was the first time that you know, cannabis did the impossible for me and it wasn't some uh, special strain or anything. It wasn't some, like, we didn't know what it was. I had heard of Charlotte's web and things like that, but I thought, you know, it had to be super special custom genetics to help it all. And it helped. So I knew what I had to do. It took years of winding down how many pharmaceuticals I was on while building my cannabis tolerance. You know, there is no way I could consume an effective dose of cannabis medicine when I first started because of like, you know, the defects of THC and stuff. Um, it took people educated in the community to reach out to me and be like, I know you're doing this to eat, but like the pharmaceuticals you're on are, are killing you and I can see it and I've known you for years and I can see it. And if you're willing to try, like I can teach you more but you're going to have to commit to this. Like you're going to have to break your tolerance. You're never going to get high again. Like you're never going to feel it, but you're going to be safer. And spent years educating myself and winding down off the pharmaceuticals. It got down to the last two and the doctors decided that it would be, it would be a danger to myself or others if I were to come off of them because, you know, epilepsy seizures are, can be fatal. Um, and they had me at the point where, they were going to approve my cannabis card to keep me comfortable while we waited for and kept me on the pharmaceuticals that were destroying me while we waited for the damage to progress to the point that the insurance would cover a lobotomy or a different type of procedure where essentially they remove part of the skull and put in a device that jumps current over the dead area, kind of akin to a pacemaker. Um, so I had nothing left to lose in choosing cannabis as medicine. I'd seen it do the impossible. And the more research I did into it, there were patient collectives on the West Coast over five years ago that made it onto the news and everything. They had a nasal spray made out of cannabis that was stopping little, little children's convulsive grand mal seizures with, within seconds. Like you could see it, the videos still exist. I fully believed that the state of New Jersey, because we'd had the medical program, I knew rec was on the table, I knew home grow was on the table. I believed that there was gonna be support and education in place for me here when I made the choices I made. And I knew if I was wrong, well, within six weeks to six months, you know, I would have just shortcut the line for the surgery and there would have been no difference at the end. But it's, there is so much potential in this medicine and I got lucky. I found needles in the haystack. Like I found a couple grams of certain strains years apart. And I would know that like, hey, if this is working for me in this format or this dosage, like you don't need as much medicine when you use the right medicine. It took about 10 years of studying to try and understand neuroscience and try to understand like plant biology and terpenes and to even get close enough to where I could pitch something to a neuroscientist I found in a cannabis group because she had talked about doing individual terpene studies in mice. 
And on a long shot, the same way I'm here begging you guys, like I reached out and begged her. I was like, this is my theory. Like, please at least just, just look at it and tell me if there's something stupid that I'm missing. If there's, it's, if there's anything obviously wrong. And it's been, it's been great. And it's been really interesting. The people I can meet and we got to go up to a med tech event and I've been to Sackler and, you know, it's, you just can't stop trying. Anytime you have a setback, any data is still good data. It all just contributes to the bigger patterns and the bigger pictures. And, you know, I'm tired of holding my breath waiting for New Jersey. I'm tired of not being able to finish this research and hearing my friends like cry to me that people died. Like if you find cannabis medicine when you're desperate, and that's how it's always been. No one wants to break the laws or risk going to jail. No one, like Paul said, like people don't even try to not even take money unless they have to, but there's a cost associated with doing these things. Like, It's it's criminal what they're doing in New Jersey, and I'm not talking about the legacy market. We can cannabis can be the future of medicine where doctors are supposed to follow the Hippocratic Oath and take the least harmful options first. Listen, I have you know, this tincture bottle can stop a seizure in under a minute with no THC in it, but I have other THC in my system. Um, it's not scary. <laughs> and a kid or a cat or a dog or anyone could drink this entire bottle and nothing would happen. Worst case, they'd sleep from the CBD. The closest thing medically we have to like an emergency response medicine for seizures is Xanax. If you're from New Jersey, or even if you're not, you know the dangers of heavy Xanax use. You know that if your cat or your kid or your dog drank that bottle, ate that bottle, they're not waking up. Neither would you. You could also have seizures from the withdrawal as well. Exactly. And right now, like this has helped another patient get through three days of clonopin withdrawal with no seizures. She has a different type of epilepsy than I do. There's real potential in this medicine. And even if you don't believe in it, like you got to understand there's damage control available in this medicine. There's neuroprotectants available in this medicine and the government's had patents on it for years. They just don't want us to have access to it. New Jersey is a very pharmaceutically based state. But it's not our fault that the rec market has to collect a certain amount of money. Like that has nothing to do with patients. The laws in New Jersey have nothing to do with patients. They have nothing to do with science. They have nothing to do with education or community or the needs of the people. And this could be on the agenda for the health and human services and senior citizens committee. If this doesn't matter to that group of people, it's their legal job, it's their obligation to take care of us. If I were to go in the hospital and try and deny the surgery, I wouldn't have the right to do that because technically human, according to a Supreme Court ruling, like human life is an interest of the state, meaning I can't choose to let something happen to myself instead of the doctors taking control and making that decision. So why won't the state take responsibility for my life right now when they're the ones killing me? Why won't they take responsibility for the people that they're denying medicine to and they're denying health care to? At least they're starting to answer our calls now. <laughs> At least we're, I have that meeting January 3rd and tomorrow I'm gonna do everything I can to get past Kasari's schedule and ensure we have one with him too. Because with the support of everyone that's been coming together and actually trying, like I have strangers who've cared enough to do things over the 
over the holidays for me and they've never met me. It shouldn't take one person coming forward and saying like, hey, you're kind of dying here. When we've had decades of support. Well, enough is enough. One week. Let's get it done. <laughs> yeah, you can email multiple times a day too for people or just, you know, check back and just keep emailing. I mean, we have seven days left and, uh, you know, yeah, just, we just got to bury them, you know, and, and say, and when, when it's over, you, you say, well, we did our absolute best, you know, and, uh, that's, what's important, but yeah, enough is enough, you know, it really is. It's, it's, it's infuriating. I mean, I don't know how, I mean, yeah, it, it's everything about it from, from being able, from just not even at all being a part of anything to them or to any decision-making, you know, to, to, to have the entire community left out generally, unless they're screaming at you, um, you know, that's, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess like any state, it's just, it's a long-term fight that we're in, you know, and, and, uh, it's about taking little, little steps and little wins and, uh, just keeping to move forward and keeping to, yes, you can email from Maryland or out of state or wherever you can email for anywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, um, about the small wins and it's about, uh, and it's about bringing in one more person with you, um, you know, and telling one more person and sending a text message to your friends, um, you know, and text, obviously like we, it's more effective if you just tell your friend, you know, and, uh, message them and let them know, Hey, just drop this. It's important. Um, you know, because anybody that's in the fight for cannabis, um, or has fought at any point, um, knows how difficult things are. And when, you know, somebody is, uh, raising their hand and asking for help from the community, that's the one thing about the cannabis community that, uh, that's one of our greatest strengths is that, um, one, our power to network and two, our power to, um, support each other when chips are down and um uh andrea we got your back i hope uh i hope other people can jump into this and make it bigger than just the people that's here um you know so community leaders um if you that bill that we posted if you can uh, print it out and post it in your workplace. Um, if you can hand that directly to your, um, your boss or union leader, um, and ask them to spread the word further. Um, anybody who you feel can reach a broader audience and, um, you know, hand it to them directly. And, um, you know, yeah, we're asking for help. So they, they definitely don't even need to be in the cannabis community, to be honest, having yeah. businesses and groups outside of the cannabis community or medical groups, different people like that reaching out, you know, saying, hey, I'm a school teacher in another state. But this is this is crazy what's going on in New Jersey. It doesn't matter who you are. Your opinion counts, especially when it's a human rights medical access issue. You know, if you're in a different state, you actually have more credibility. Patients here can't speak up about like the life-saving potential of RSO because technically we've never had proper access. You know, we can't speak up about rosin and solventless edibles because the only way we could technically make them for many years was if you bought that much dispensary bud that's already dried and then tried to press it yourself. And like, you're allowed to do certain things in New Jersey. I'm allowed to operate a heated hydraulic press, but I'm not allowed to grow a plant. So I don't know anyone anywhere 
can absolutely chime in and you definitely don't need to be in the cannabis industry. But if you are, we have an industry support letter going around too for different dispensaries and labs and people willing to stand up and say commerce is not a priority over patients. Veterans groups, I think, uh, you know, the um, yes. one. Yeah, We're working think... on getting a veteran support letter together the same way we did an industry support letter. If cool. anyone has interest in heading that up and writing the initial couple paragraphs, I'll so happy to work with you with it. We have a few American legions that are willing to pass it around and get signatures on it because the government does is more willing to listen to veterans. And that was something that I've heard back through channels of certain policy writers and things like that is a veteran voice would would help because these are people we trusted to protect our freedom, but we don't trust them to garden. Like that's a disgrace. That's a disgrace. These people have sacrificed so much and now we're extorting them to get to their medication. Not all dispensaries in New Jersey have veteran access programs and sometimes Veterans are taking multiple forms of public transport to even get access to a dispensary where they can kind of afford their medicine. And even then the selection isn't what they need. It's veterans definitely have a voice in this, but I know, unfortunately, they've been denied this access, access to this medicine more than the rest of us for too long. So, yeah, if you're a veteran, because this is the research associated with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and cannabis is is great. You should really look into it. Or if you suffer with night terrors, getting over a certain dosage of THC actually prevents you from getting into REM. Like we are willing to help you if you want resources, because I know the VFW doesn't necessarily provide them. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to make a quick shout out to veterans because again, wouldn't be here without you. Yeah. Yeah. Organizations that it doesn't have to be cannabis organizations, um, you know, just organizations that, that are sympathetic and will support. Um, um, yeah. Andrea, I really want to thank you for coming on to FCP and sharing your insight. Um, I know, especially like, and I'm not like, oh, you're so young, but it's like somebody as young as you willing to come and put your face forward. Thank you. It's hard to do that and be an advocate. So, and ye, listening to you, you would think you were 150 years old. So, so it, uh, I know that the chats really enjoyed you. Um, Thank you. Kristen, I do, I do have a question for you. Um, being an analytical lab, um, it kind of took me a minute to wrap my head because like in Canada, the analytical labs, they really want to focus on the big commercial grows. So I, I am grateful that somebody that has uh, the position that you have has kind of spearheaded this. Um, it's not something that I ever expected to see. So if you're in New Jersey and you need an analytical lab, please get a hold of Kristen. Thank you. So she's, she's one of the good ones and part of the community. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's um, genuinely raising standards out there. And that was the first license in the state. And they've genuinely been advocating for patients and clean medicine and understanding what they're working with and how to make it better for the future. And, I've been fangirling over Tricomb for a long time before I actually got to meet them. They were one of the first people in New Jersey who put Felindrin on their terpene panel. So yeah, anyone who's looking for an analytic lab or just wants honest results on their medicine, I'd say. Um, actually, so Andrea mentioned that you created a home grow safety panel. Can you explain that more to me? Oh yeah, um, so I, I was working with Paul on uh, creating dif uh, different types of panels uh, that would be like useful for home growers, um, whether it's just, you know, cannabinoids, terpene profile, or like a safety panel, something that just kind of made sense. So we worked together on that to sort of figure out 
what makes sense to test for um, as far as like, you know, making sure that there's no mycotoxins present and things like that. Uh, whereas you know, maybe some of the, like I had mentioned earlier, the quality indicator test where you're using beneficial microbes, like that's kind of a useless test uh, because you're putting beneficial microbes on your plants. You will fail like a total aerobic bacteria test, things like that. So yeah, uh, working uh, with Paul, we, we do have a panel and um, we can get that through as HydroShop um, and we would do the testing for that. Um, but I, so going back to, I think the, the initial point, um, I started getting involved in this. It was kind of random. Um, I uh, Someone reached out to me regarding the safety aspect of home grow and um, uh, the uh, availability of testing for homegrown products and how that would look like under the current regulations. So I did, I was able to sort of clarify uh, with them that it is allowed under uh, NJAC 1730 for personal use testing. And so anything that is grown at home could, could potentially get testing. Not like, this is not a, like a big revenue stream for like an analytical testing lab. So that's why it's unusual, I think, for um, someone that's involved in laboratories to be talking about this topic. But as I continued to like uh, think about it, talk to people and figure where we were in New Jersey and where we should be, like it just, it made no sense to me. Um, you know, I was in this fight from the beginning to fight for testing in New Jersey from when my mom was in the medical program back in 2016. And I was looking at the COAs and I was like, what the hell is this? Like this was tested eight years ago and trying to figure out like what New Jersey was doing differently from other states and why there weren't any actual analytical laboratories. And I, I was working in an analytical laboratory in a different industry. Um, so I was very confused why this was not happening in New Jersey. And, um, that's really why I started Tricom Analytical in the first place was because there was no testing in New Jersey to the to the point that it needed to be to provide that information to patients because we were I was trying to I mean my mom was a chemist and so we were going through the chemical profiles the terpenes the cannabinoids and trying different uh, therapies and things like that and um, that information wasn't available because no one was testing for it so I mean these patients were not able to figure out what they needed uh, or what they were using and what worked and what didn't work. And then if, if a certain strain's out, like how to um, find a similar strain based off of the terpene and the cannabinoid profile. So I was just completely lacking in New Jersey. And then also like combined with like my background experience in ISO 1705 running uh, analytical laboratories, it was just like an easy sort of um, uh, avenue for me to take uh, once the um, uh, once the industry got established in New Jersey and through the 2019 uh, expansion of the medical they, they did allow for, for cannabis testing laboratories and that's really when I started um, working more towards this so and at home grows just a part of that it's like yeah okay well the legal industry has failed continually patients they have been failing patients for the last 14 years so let's um, figure out what works because <laughs> at the end of the day that's really what matters in this industry and that's why I got involved in the first place I appreciate that Kristen wow. yeah. thank you that's the other thing that we're we hope to be fighting for in the future um, is a smaller license um, at least I mean aside from home grow and medical that's really important but yeah it's also important uh, you know, for people that need to expand beyond a 10 by 10 or have more, have professional, you know, don't have the time to grow or whatever. Um, I mean, those smaller licenses that, you know, every well-known business was started in someone's garage or basement, you know, that um, you can move from a 10 by 10 to a, a small commercial facility, a thousand square feet or something that, that like, you know, allows you to learn the ropes or um, just do a smaller grow that doesn't cost like one to two million dollars and, you know, your life savings and everything else just to apply it. I mean, it's insane. It really is. It's like and and, uh, you know, they got to be able to find ways to, to fit us in, um, you know, 
growers and home growers really are. I mean, it's there's no rich people growing wheat. <laughs> it's working yeah, class. Right. It's people that are struggling. You know, like it's people that are finding a small little area in their house to make a peaceful place and uh, and know how their medicine is handled and share it with their other friends. Our culture is like baseball cards. It's not, you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's just, yeah. I mean, like I said, it's, it's aggravating to talk about, um, but we're trying to focus on what is needed, you know, and that's what's important, not what is wrong with everything, but what is needed and how we can get there. It is hard being an activist and an advocate and uh again andrea's starting off so early in life i commend you on that it took me 25 years to be more public about my medical cannabis use which is for chronic pain but uh I, you guys are great like i'm so happy that dr schwabi introduced me to Kristen about a year ago and uh, we've had her on the channel lots and any one of you anytime you want to come back on and talk uh, Kristen can get you my email address or Kristen can be the host and put it together again. So, um, we're coming up on the two hour mark. I, I still have lots of time to go and meet, but I don't know, like it's getting late on the East coast. It's about nine 30 at night for you guys. So, um, what I'd like to do is go through the room and, uh, just get some closing thoughts, but we're going to start with Sam cause we really didn't hear much from Sam. We heard from him, but we haven't heard from him in a, in a minute. All right. Did, did you have any que final questions or? Um, uh, if not, yeah. I can. Well, so what's your preferred method of grow, growing for yourself or patients? For myself, <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really big on living soil and organics. Um, I do that. That should not negate the fact that like you can grow great cannabis any way that you choose to grow because I have friends that grow great cannabis every which way. Um, but I am very personally very big on living soil. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that we might not even necessarily have the full proof of why it's better yet. Um, it's honestly a very new concept. We only, only like two or three years ago, did we actually discover that the way plants feed in nature is what we are trying to replicate in living soil. So there's people that have been growing this way for very long periods of time, some of them longer than I've been alive again, but we only in the past couple of years have discovered like how living soil actually works and why it works. Um, and I think for like some of the, especially for some of the older guys that have been doing it the way that they were taught for so long, I think it's a really big change and a really different way of thinking about gardening. Um, and so I, I think for a lot of people, it, it can be tough, but for me, I just see it as it's hard knowing what I like having read those research papers about like how plants feed and things like that. I can't help but feel that like it's the, how you should be growing plants because it's how they feed in nature. Um, I tend to get a lot of pushback when I start to say things like that, but um, it, it is how I feel about it. And again, it's not to negate that you can grow amazing cannabis with synthetics and salts and all of those other things. Cause again, I have friends that do it. Um, but for me personally, I don't see myself growing any way other than living soil. And Andrea, can do you have a preference between living soil or synthetics or? Um, I think it all matters who's growing it because you should definitely be comfortable and knowledgeable in the methods that you use. You know, someone might be the best, you know, salts grower, but their first batch of living soil might be a little rough. Um, so it's all about. Uh, trusting the people. I've never grown myself personally. And from a scientific standpoint, I do think there is something to sun and soil that we haven't been able to fully replicate yet with, with lights or with just nutrients. Um, but I think that's why we need a lot more science on it. 
for someone like me with mold and yeast sensitivities who's allergic to anything fermented, if I was in the position where I'd need to flip my bed up in my room to put te grow tents in there, I'd do that. But living soil might not be the best choice for me with certain sensitivities. So it's all about how people handle the plant. And it's all about knowing what you're working with. And that's why I'd hope to work with experienced growers like Sam and Paul and Rongo who can help me figure out what's best. Because unfortunately, going through the legal or legacy markets, it's very rare that you actually know how your plants are handled. You know, even if you have a COA, you have no clue if they just gave up on the grow and remediated it. Um, I think that's why we need knowledge and education and I'm not out here to claim to be a grower. Um, I want not to yet. be a grower. <laughs> not, not yet, at least. But not yeah. yet. We don't um, know. <laughs> but it, I haven't, if everything goes through January 4th, I potentially even have an option for a cut of a version of the genetics that I might need. But that's where I'm like, hey, if this waits past then, I'm like, I might never see it again. So I'm like, there's a lot riding on lot riding on the next couple of weeks. You know, I'm hoping we can hit the ground running with research and with education and networking with the nonprofit and creating, you know, a source for education in New Jersey. But if they deny us, we just shift gears and we work towards emergency decriminalization because the position New Jersey has put me in, I have nothing else I can do besides lay down and give up or try to let them hear us. It is really disappointing that uh, there's a failure on getting access for you. That That is saddening. Like I, there's no other way to put it, right? And I can tell that you've surrounded yourself with a lot of really compassionate people. Um, yeah. So, again, thank you for sharing your story because I, I can relate to how hard that is to do. So, Paul... I Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Just real quick. I honestly, like, I think the most disappointing part of all of that, like the, the failure on their part is that like, as, as far as we know, and like, we've been told this to, like pretty directly is that like, there is bipartisan support for this bill. It already has support. The politicians that should be voting on this want to vote on this. They want all, they're already ready we honestly kind of threw a, a, you know, a wrench in their plans by tr like trying to get the language changed. They were almost ready to do this. And it's for three years now, it's been blocked by one person. There's one person in the entire New Jersey state government who has stopped us from having home grow for almost three years now. And it's, it's mind boggling to me that he's still around. His name is Nicholas Gutari. He is our Senate president, which means that he has control over who gets like what bills get read on the Senate floor. So they've had a home, a medical home girl and a recreational home girl bill in the Senate for, uh, for over two years now, two and a half, almost three years. It'll be three years, I believe coming up in March, February or March. Um, and like he has solely blocked that bill from being read. So even though all of our constituents support us, they can't do anything about it because it's all based on whether he wants that bill to be read in front of the Senate to be voted on. And they're scared to speak up ahead of time and sign their support to the bill because they understand that the Senate president picks who's on different committees and whatnot, and no one wants to stick their neck out if it's not going to go anywhere. But that's the point we're at is we do have enough support for this to go somewhere. And I, I hate to keep asking, but anyone who's willing to reach out to the Senate, especially overnight tonight, I'm supposed to be hearing from Skatari's scheduler by, by lunchtime tomorrow, or I have aides in the office who are going to try to ensure that I get to speak to him because he should be in the office tomorrow. We need as much visible support because they hear from me every day. I want to show them what we can pull off in one day. They, you know, seeing what we could pull off over Christmas weekend is what got my foot in the door, is what got Vitaly's attention so I can have that meeting with him before before the last day the committee meets. We really need to get in with Skatari too. That's, he's been 
the only real roadblock in this. And he publicly to the press admits that like, he thinks this is inevitable. So let's show him that now it, it's inevitable now. Like this has to happen. I, I'm interested to see if Future Cannabis Project had any effects. So please keep me posted. Definitely. Um, that would be pretty awesome if it did. Um, but it, you guys get the credit for it. Um, we couldn't do this without the platform. Like I said, I don't even well, have social okay. media set up or anything yet. So it's just been me like screaming at my wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. We need to thank Peter. Uh, Peter owns Future Cannabis Project, and uh, he he's been gracious enough to let me drive his car for the last while. Haven't banged it up yet. Um, so, uh, Rongo, I, uh, I I'm curious as to like your preference for growing, whether it's living soil or. Um, as of this week, I'm ten years in living soil. Ooh, that's an accomplishment. <laughs> but um, if possible, I'd like to not talk about myself, and I'd like to maybe end it by asking Andrea some questions that might help uh, other people with similar issues. Yeah, um, that'd, be, that'd the, be awesome. F first one being, before, before I ask anything else, um, I know you said your friend has a different type of epilepsy than you. Um, ha have you found any uh, difference or variation in effectiveness of the medicine you're using between what you're dealing with and what your friends deal with? Absolutely. Um, but one thing I have found overall is that patients make the best medicine. If you can find an epileptic grower, a lot more of their seed library is likely to be suited to you because these are the people that work for years to stabilize genetics because it works for them and other people with similar conditions. Um, so yeah, really finding other people with similar issues can help give you a starting point, but your terpene preference is going to be custom to you. Like I said, I was on a combination of nine different pharmaceuticals. So if you want to think of it that way, like at the very least, it would be logical that I would need nine different strains to treat these different conditions. But that's the beauty of cannabis is you can find these synergistic profiles where you don't need <laughs> handfuls of pills to treat side effects from pills. You can work your ratios down, but there's no, until we can finish our research, because we're at the point where we're looking to tie biometric effects and everything so we can do more predictive responses with terpenes and epilepsy. It's a lot easier to quantify than it would be for like something like depression. Um, you can see and you can test actively if someone is having a seizure. Um, so we'll be is there anything? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please. I was gonna say, is there anything that you feel like for yourself or generally you can say like uh you know, like something like I don't know, like limonene is usually good for seizures or usually bad for seizures? Um, I would say a lot of people I've found with epilepsy shy away from strong sativas. Um and I would say Well, what about like terpenes specifically or like compounds specifically? Compounds specifically, I mean, I would praise humulene if you're looking for anything because it's been shown to have stronger than steroid level effects for like inflammation and things like that. So if you're a person with optic eye pressure or increased um, cranial pressure, if you are already having seizures, that can kind of help do a little bit of that damage control and like reduce certain pressures. Um, the dangerous terps are different for everyone. Like I said, I have a variety of conditions. Um, I would hate to tell someone to shy away from something that's actually beneficial for them. Like for me, felandrine is essential in a lot of ways. But if I do a disproportionately high amount of felandrine, it's actually dangerous for me. Um, it's all about the other ratios and the way things work together. That's one of the reasons we see so many failures on the science side right now because they're only allowed to test in isolate and like THC and isolate is very different than full plant medicine and terpenes in isolate are very different than the synergistic properties. Um, like beta carophyllene affects the pharmacokinetic. So it affects how everything else is going to be absorbed in your body. Uh, scatol, I believe is something new that they've just discovered and that, yep, I, think a file, I believe. Yep. Um, and that, 
actually makes everything else way more effective in your system. It increases the potency of everything else. So we're a long way away from knowing everything, but we've also done like a pain and sleep blend. All of the formulations and everything we do are based off of real plant genetics and real patients and real strains and what's worked for larger groups. And then we're able to narrow it down and kind of kind of see the patterns like, hey, in all of these strains, they have these sets of terps. Or like you might look at lineage and be like, hey, everything derived from chocolate tie is good for me. But this one strain is is bad. It sets me off. You would be able to look at that one strain compared to the rest of the profiles and identify, oh, this has a high amount of limonene. This has a high amount of certain things like terpinaline is another one that's curious because it helps a lot of people with depression, but it can also be counterproductive in high amounts. So learning how to tailor it for yourself. There's actually a book that I started out with called Cannabis Pharmacy many years ago. So I'm sure a lot of the information is outdated, but it breaks down each terp and it gives certain examples of like, what? oh, does this work on the CB1 receptor? Does this work on CB2? So the more educated you can be about your own condition too, and if you can look at the pharmaceuticals you were on or are on and see which part of the brain's they're targeting, you might be able to reverse engineer some of that stuff. And if that sounds crazy to you, like I said, just hit my email and I will help to the best of my ability. And once we have this nonprofit set up, we'll be able to help a lot more formally. <laughs> Um, um, last part of my question, since you touched on the thiols, like, so aside from terpenes, is there anything else you find found very useful, like as far as flavonoids or carotenoids or anthocyanins or esters or anything like that? That's the tricky part about not being able to work with whole plant medicine where I'm at right now. Um, because, and not having testing until within about the last month is actually when I found access to testing through trichome. Um, so I've been really limited in certain areas. That's one of the, my biggest motivations for having my own plants is to be able to understand what else is in there because I know terpenes are only a small, small portion of the mix, um, but it's the only portion I've really had access to the research on because these terpenes are found in other medicinal herbs and other plants and everywhere throughout nature and the way New Jersey overregulates and strips everything away from us. I wanted to work with something that they couldn't take away. You know, we can, the tinctures that I make are a way to offer strain specific treatments in states that do not allow any THC. These tinctures are THC free. Like, and I can make them for pennies on the dollar compared to traditional medicine. So, and they're CBD tinctures. There's, you know, they're as regulated as the ones you see in your yoga shop or pizza shop. Like, I'm willing to help friends who are trying to educate themselves because I'm, that's the only way I was able to educate myself. But we need full research. We need full plant medicine. And understanding, even if you can only start with CBDs, not all CBDs are created equal. There's a difference between isolates and full spectrum. Bluebird Botanicals is completely legal in all 50 states, and they have a version, a high potency signature blend that is half raw and half decarbed CBD. And it's one of the most effective CBDs I've ever found for myself. So there's so much to understand the things we're learning about CBG right now and how it's like the parent molecule and how it can break down and turn into everything else. We're so far away from knowing what we're actually working with, but the first step is being able to work with it. <laughs> um, but there is a lot of hope and there's a lot of a lot of interest in research and in medical communities for the potential for this stuff. And I'm hoping if I can focus in on terpenes, there are going to be other people who can focus in on their specific areas, you know, that they found and we can all collaborate together because I haven't had the chance to work with my specific strains and grow them as a one-to-one -one ratio. One-to-ones used to be great for me for THC and CBD when I first started, but I haven't had access to that. So I will, I am so eager to collaborate on this research and figure out what else helps. And I just got to get through this last week first. <laughs>
Um, kind of going off what you said about like reverse engineering some of these things. Um, that's actually exactly how I, you know, went about trying to treat my conditions back when I started, when I first got my medical card, uh, almost like five, over five years ago now, um, terpenes weren't even a conversation, like to the point that when you walked into a dispensary, ask them about terpenes, they would tell you there's no actual medical scientific studies that say that terpenes do anything. So like, I can't actually tell you about that as a dispensary employee. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I, this is a conversation that many of us are having that we already know about. Like, how are, how can I, how can you tell me you can't talk about that? And they would just say, yeah, nah, it, it, we don't have any proof of that, but the CBG will help you. And I ended up having to like, reverse engineer these things by like i have i deal with stomach issues and uh depression and anxiety and adhd so i have like quite a few little things but mostly going for like the stomach issues stuff so i started looking into like chinese herbs and india like you know ancient herbs that they would use to treat their stomach issues and things like that and then i would figure out what terpenes and things were in those herbs and stuff like that and then i would go and i would find cannabis strains that had like you know uh, terpenes that coordinated to those profiles and that was how i started to do it and so like they weren't talking about mercine i had to smell it and see if it smelled like hops or i had to like i had to learn these things and then buy stuff that was oh well, not so helpful just to I get the reference of what it smelled like so I could know if it was going to help me in the future. Um, it was definitely a daunting task, but it's, I don't know, it was interesting and it allowed me to learn a lot. Um, so yeah, it definitely can be weird to have to reverse engineer some of that stuff, but it's definitely possible and it can teach you more that you did, like might not be able to have learned without doing that sort of weird backwards research into it. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and that's why hopefully if we have the organization set up for medicinal plants as a whole, where we can study all of them, regardless of, you know, the legalization in New Jersey, if we have to wait to have a community cannabis garden, we'll wait to have a community cannabis garden. But for right now, patients like Sam and I know how hard it is to just scrounge around for information and figure out what you can trust or how much of it is behind paywalls. Like, one of my biggest resources that I had was having one of my best friends be a librarian. Like it sounds so silly, but that's really where we're at in New Jersey. And if we can educate people on the stuff that the Senate's less scared of, maybe they'll be willing to eventually hear that, Oh, you know, this is found in lavender and you know, this is how you would use honey or goji berry and this is how you would use cannabis because it's all really the same conversation you know we're not we're not asking to have large commercial grows for ourselves we're asking to be able to like make our grandmother's tea with the scrap plant material um we need to show them it's not scary and we need the platform for education because all of this is overshadowed right now. And all of this is an opportunity for healing and for community support when everyone's been so isolated for so long. So our good friend Rotten Skateboards has a question. Are you allowed to gift cannabis in New Jersey? Up to yes. an ounce. Up to an ounce yeah. at a time. Um, so yes, there are certain avenues in New Jersey, but there are also still medical refugees leaving New Jersey in 2023 with one of the longest standing medical programs in the country. Travis has got a follow up here. How can gifting be translated to a grassroots compassion program? Well, the group would have 
you know, local events. Sometimes they would be seminars at libraries or sometimes they would be a puff and paint where things might be able to be donated. And, you know, the consumers who show up that are of legal age and ac access, you know, they would be able to potentially collect a free gift. Um, the other thing is being structured as a nonprofit and an educational nonprofit, we would be genuinely looking to do um, different educational events and promote research and promote reliable information being distributed to the public because the CRC hasn't necessarily done that. Um, and we want to be in the position where we can help when psilocybin gets legalized because the Senate has had more energy on that than cannabis over the last year. Um, so the gifting program in terms of like physical medication, we have a little bit of limitations until New Jersey changes, but being a tax deductible donation means anyone who does not agree with how their tax dollars are being spent in terms of regulating cannabis or regulating any medicinal plants would be able to make a tax deductible donation to the medicinal plants nonprofit. It wouldn't cost them anything, but they would know that their tax dollars are getting used for appropriate community resources and eventually building towards a full community center where people can come in and see a garden and learn how to do their infusions and learn how to handle this without shame and fear. Nice. Thank you, Andrea. So we're getting pretty late here now. Um, I do want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, Paul or Kristen, or if any of you have any closing thoughts, we can do that. And then maybe I'll roll the credits. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for putting us on and giving us like this platform for our voices uh, to be heard. Uh, regarding homegrown in New Jersey. Um, I just want to sort of reiterate, you know, the importance of um, sending out this email to our senators that are holding this bill hostage and uh, force them to get it to committee uh, by January 4th uh, so that it can go to vote within this session and hopefully pass uh, to allow our patients to grow their medicine. I know uh, within the past, 14 plus years, there's been a lot of, um, you know, corruption and things like that in New Jersey. A lot of people are sort of dejected. They just don't care anymore. But um, it's t the time is now. Uh, people are listening. It's making a difference. I think uh, just kind of overwhelming them with this outreach is really impacting them. There are conversations that are being had as a direct result of our outreach. And if we continue doing this with the momentum that we have, it will it will eventually make a difference. So please send those emails. Um, yeah, the only, I think three, there's three things that we have. The, uh, the email link, that's a direct email link. Um, that's the tiny URL support s S three, four, two. And then, um, there's the industry support letter, uh, which is that's for, um, uh, businesses owners of businesses management anybody representing a cannabis company to sign that it's an editable document um so just put your name and title on that um and then the third is the um uh the flyer that we've been showing the green one to uh, print that out and post it at your workplace hand it to a friend hand it to a um, union rep or organizer or organization um share it on social media even yeah it's about a week i mean you know it's 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 not long but if you could take uh a few moments a day beginning and end to send those emails and um just get this to somebody else and um so we can overwhelm them that's what we should be good at I feel like strength in numbers for sure Last reminder that if any veterans wanted to come together on a letter of support, you can email me at rabelresearch at gmail.com. So rabel, like it's spelled on screen right here, and then research at gmail.com. And we'd love to make sure your voice is heard too. 
and two small resources uh, for um, if you're looking. Well, uh, Tricom and Local has on their uh, Instagram has a lot of uh, terpenes and um, just to learn about basics um, and um, for growing uh, your local grow shop. Uh, keep it old school mm -hmm. and uh, come see us down in South Jersey. And awesome. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry, just real quick. If anyone needs any of these links or any of this information or would like to, we actually have um, weekly meetings to discuss these things and to try and, you know, keep everyone on the same page and move these things forward. Um, so if anyone needs access to any of these links or to uh, our group where we discuss this stuff, um, all of that is available on my Instagram, which is uh, Shramuel, uh, same as same spelling is in the description and everything. Uh, so if anyone needs any of that stuff and you're having trouble finding it, you can uh, you can find my Instagram and it will have all that information on there uh, in its own section on my uh, link tree. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. <laughs> my mic was muted. Not a problem. <laughs> Hopefully I spelled it right. My spelling's atrocious. Okay. So let's come back here and do this you guys are great um so the voter like we'll get news january 4th is, is that what we're supposed to january 4th is the last chance for it to go to committee uh prior to this session uh, uh completion uh and uh so uh that's why we're emailing vitaly to get it on the committee meeting um with skatari uh you know cc and then um, if it can go through committee, then it could potentially go to vote um, by the 9th. Um, and if not, then it will have to be reintroduced next session um, for the next year's um, build. So uh, this yeah. is like the last chance of the year, basically. Um, and then uh, if it does get delayed, I mean, there is a high probability of it going through next year. Uh, it's just, you know, a timing thing. I mean, this is patient access. This is important for people. And um, we should try to get it pushed through during this link up session where more things can get pushed through. Awesome. What, was someone saying we're showing up to the state house on January 4th, too? Oh, you're muted. Muted. Oh, yes. Um, originally, a group called Sativa Cross had pulled permits to be there January 25th. And then we ended up finding out that January 4th is the last option for this because New Jersey is pretty good at that. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be out there showing support on January 4th, knowing it's the last day it could be on the committee. Um, hopefully we hear it's on the agenda before then, but it has been on the agenda before and then removed at the last minute. So we want to make sure they see our faces at the Trenton State House January 4th, and they know we won't be ignored this time. Awesome. All the luck to you guys. On that note, Future Cannabis Project, I'm going to roll the credits. Hey.